Welcome. My name is Roger Berkowitz. I'm the founder and academic director of the Hannah Arendt Center at Bard College, where I teach politics, philosophy, and human rights. Today's lecture is on revitalizing American democracy, citizen assemblies as a Republican form of government. When I give you this title about democracy and republicanism, I'm highlighting a real disagreement or, or, or controversy amongst people who talk about and write about democracy and citizen assemblies today. We often think about citizen assemblies as revitalizing democracy. And yet, there's another way to imagine what we're talking about, which is to revitalize a Republican form of government. Republicanism, not Republican Party, but Republicanism as an idea, stands for the principle of self-government, of free government, that is not governed by a monarch or a legislature or outsiders, but is governed by the citizens themselves. And when we think about that, it's important to remember that the United States was imagined not as a democracy. It was imagined as a republic, specifically a federal constitutional representative republic. In the Constitution, what's guaranteed to every American is a Republican form of government, not a Democratic form of government. It's a government in which the people rule, the people have power, and that's what matters. And you think, oh, well, that means a democracy, and yet not really. The founders were actually terrified of democracy. They saw democracy as mob rule. They saw democracy as the potential of the tyranny of the democracy. Um, and they were worried that if you had a democracy, you would lose your freedoms very quickly, and people would elect, elect demagogues and dictators and um, give, up, give up their freedoms. And so what was, what was imagined was not democracy, but republicanism, the idea that there would be um, institutions that allow for self-government. And within that, uh, one of them that they thought was very important was election or electoral representation. Um, so James Madison writes that the elective mode of obtaining rulers is the characteristic policy of Republican government, not Democratic government, but Republican government. The idea being that if you elect people, especially in a big republic, you'll have a lot of people to choose from, you'll have a lot of elites to choose from, you'll have a lot of rich people to choose from, well-educated to choose from, and as a result, you'll get good leaders who will respect the people and, and, and will allow the, people to, the people's voices uh, to, to emerge. And so election became part of what they understood as republicanism. The danger, however, of this election and republican form of government is that insofar as there are liberties and people can elect who they want, the great danger is factions. That one group of people will elect these people, one group of people will elect those people, and the factions will fight it out, and the people on the south will fight against the people in the north, and the, and, and the people who want business to run versus the people who want the farm business to be a federal, a, a, a farming-based or agricultural-based republic, and all these different factions will emerge, and one faction will try and become supreme and suppress all the others. And James Madison, um, articulated this problem when he said that liberty is to faction what air is to fire. You can't cure the problem of factions, which is a great threat to liberty, because by taking away liberty, because then you don't have liberty in the first place. And so the founders had two great ideas, two innovations that they thought would protect American republicanism from the danger of faction. The first is that you would create a large republic, the United States. And because it was so large, you would actually have lots of factions. And because there were many factions, you had the West, you had the South, you had the North, you had the East, you had the rich and the poor, but you also had farmers and, and mercantile people and business people, shippers and everything. And because you had all these different factions, no one faction would be able to control all the others. And so the idea was create a large republic and you won't actually have to worry about people being virtuous, as Montesquieu had once said, that you needed small, virtuous republics. You can have a large republic and all the different factions would balance each other out. The second solution was federalism. And remember, I said that America is a federal constitutional representative republic. Federalism is not just the dual structure of federalism where you have the federal government and the state governments. 
You also have city governments, town governments, fact, you, have, you have NGOs, you have lots of groups, and, and each one of these groups um, articulates different points of view and argues for different things and fights for their interests. And it's, it's this federalist principle, which again, gives power to many different factions, real political power, that they saw as the greatest um, way to overcome the danger of faction in modern government. And so um, what, fa what federalism does is it means that there's no single source of sovereignty in the United States. There's no one rule. It's not the president, it's not Congress, but it's also not the federal government or the states. They all fight with each other. And that central principle, what Hannah Arendt calls the idea that only power can check power. That the only way to prevent one structure, one faction from taking over is to create other factions that have power and they can fight each other. Only power can check power. And that was the great innovation of the American Republican form of government. And so Hannah Arendt calls this the American experience of power. That in America, you created multiple power structures that would fight each other. And that what she saw is that in the, in the early stages of the American Republic, and even pre-1776, the American colonists understood that politics was about power and they wanted to attain power. And they had all sorts of different, they had towns, they had town halls, they had counties. All of these different structures were about attaining power. And the American experience of power was that we had the right to pursue our interests through our own power structures. And our constitutional system created that, uh, that framework in which we could do so. However, Arendt thought that this American experience of power failed. And it failed because in the end, even though we had this federalist constitution, the only two aspects of federalism that the constitution recognized were the federal government and the state's government, not counties, local, town councils, et cetera. And so what happened? People got used to having all the power in the country only in the hands of state and federal representatives. And so what did they do? They stopped going to town hall meetings. They stopped participating in government. Self-government became something that faded from their memory and their experience. And as a result, they lost the habit of governing themselves, the Republican tradition. Thomas Jefferson worried about this. And in, in the early 19th century, in 1816, he started writing letters to his friends saying, the great mistake we made in our constitution was that we didn't constitutionally institutionalize local government, places where citizens could come together and have power to make decisions. And Arendt picks that up and, and argues that, that that was the great loss and failure of the American uh, form of government. And what she says is in losing that experience of, of acting in politics with power, what we lost was the space of power and the space of freedom. And this is where I come back to sortition and, and, and civic assemblies and argue that what civic assemblies really offer in the United States, in our tradition, is not necessarily democracy. We have democracy in some degree. What they offer is a return to self-government, to the return to the habit of engaging in conversation and debates with other people in institutions that have power. It's a return to republicanism. And that's what the, the return to and the movement for citizen assemblies in the United States can bring. And when you think about it this way, you realize that we already have an institution in the United States that exactly works on this model, and it's called the jury. The jury, which is actually required by the U.S. Constitution, allows 12 people to come together and make meaningful decisions about right and wrong, who should be punished and who should not, who's innocent, who's guilty, who's responsible, who's not. And what juries do is not just that they make good decisions, because sometimes they make good decisions, sometimes they make wrong decisions, but they habituate people in how to be part of a moral government. Alexis de Tocqueville, in his book, Democracy in America, understood this. And he wrote, the jury serves to communicate the spirit of the judges to the minds of all citizens. And this spirit, with the habits which attend to it, is the soundest preparation for free institutions. What Tocqueville is saying is that the, the great brilliance of the jury 
is not that it makes the right or wrong decision, but that it teaches us how to judge from the perspective of the public, from the community, from the judge's perspective. That's what citizen assemblies, sometimes called citizen juries, can do. Citizen juries, citizen assemblies, can do in politics what the jury does in law. It can bring people together and return to them, rehabituate to them, retrain them, re-nurture in them this public spirit of political engagement where they talk about what do we want? Do we want teachers or do we want bridges or do we want guns? Do we want abortion or not? Do we want immigration or not? And if they have these debates and they talk about them, they realize these issues are much more complicated than the polarized political debate allows. And they get used to talking to people they disagree with, they get used to hearing other sides, and they begin to understand that politics is actually about finding compromises, finding the lowest common denominator that we can agree on. And that return is what offers the possible return of the Republican tradition, of citizen power, of self-government, and what Hannah Arendt calls the spaces of freedom. And in her book on revolution, she says the councils, these originally little ward systems, these councils where people got together and talked about public affairs were spaces of freedom. It's a beautiful line, spaces of freedom. That's part of the Republican tradition of self-government, and that's what citizen assemblies potentially offer us in our effort to revitalize our American Republican tradition. Thank you very much.